Yumiko, good to see you in our first, what is our first OECD Berlin Center Tete a Tete. We thought uh, we'd ask a particularly interesting person from an interesting region to join us, um, uh, Japan, and you're leading the OECD Tokyo Center. Uh, welcome to all the participants who are joining us uh, today. Yumiki, the first question I would like to ask you is, what time is it in Japan? Good question. It's pretty dark. It's 9.30 p.m. Friday night. <laughs> okay. So I'd like to think that you joined me on a Friday night because you like me so much. But, yes, exactly. you know, yeah, having worked... Any request coming from you. Having worked with so many Japanese colleagues, uh, I do tend to believe that it's something like normal office hours now in Tokyo. So how is it? And be open. I, I, I won't be offended. So it's, do many people no, still sit in the office now at this time? It's, it's, everything is relative, but uh, compared to the past in the Japanese context, uh, people are definitely putting shorter hours uh, in the office. But again, as I said, everything is, is, is relative. So compared to Germany, I'm sure the situation here is still very crazy. Yeah. Um, you, know, you probably know Japanese people tend to put in very long hours in the office. And uh, there have been a problem. There has been a problem in terms of, you know, quality of life and, and you know, other health issues. And there has been very strong push uh, by the government to correct correct that sort of pattern mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. over the last couple of years. But together with the COVID situation, uh, there has been a big shift in terms of, you know, how people work, uh, people having cutting back their hours, people working from home. So we have seen quite a bit of change. But then again, it's a relative mm -hmm. change within the context of Japan and compared to Huge hours. Germany yeah. or other countries <laughs> in Europe, we are still putting very long hours. Definitely. I remember working in the G7 context a little bit, and sometimes we were sending mails, you know, and it was one o'clock in Tokyo, and they would answer immediately. We were a little bit uh, Oh, yeah, one o'clock, no problem. <laughs> you could still get a response at three o'clock in the morning. <laughs> yeah, you, Miku, so you're a very interesting person. You came to, so you, are, you used to be an investment banker in the United States, and I think you came to the Tokyo Center, so after many years in the United States, you came back to Japan in, um, in well, I think eight years ago or so. When was that? Yeah. Seven years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So how how was that? Because we just talked about the Japanese corporate culture, <clears throat> many differences with Europe for sure, but also the United States. And then you told well, you became also sort of a champion of gender parity in in. Uh, in Japan, I understand, under the womenomics, uh, you know, the efforts by former Prime Minister Abe to push the presence of, of women in the workplace. Um, so for you coming back from the United States, how was it in general to come back to Japan, but perhaps specific, specifically as a professional woman? What, what did you see at the time? Um, it was a, a, a very much of a culture shock in, in a way when I came back here, you know, about 10 years ago, I spent almost all my adult life in the United States. I went to school there and then I basically stayed um, in the U.S. Um, um, as I started to work um, uh, in, in the U.S., but also a couple of years in London and a couple other places, but not in Japan. So, like I said, uh, I spent almost all my adult life, professional life outside Japan. When I came back here, it was a very big culture shock I, I felt. I'm a Japanese, uh, you know, woman, you know, I was born and raised here. I speak the language. I look Japanese. I am Japanese. So I realized there was a very um, different expectation in terms of how I would behave or how I would carry myself uh, in meetings and, you know, public situations versus you know, expectation um, for, you know, my male counterparts, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was uh, something that I had to get used to when I got back to, to when I came back to Japan. I got used to it, but I still think it's kind of crazy how women mm -hmm. are completely different, you know, sort of, um, you know, they're put in a different category in, in the society and economy. Things are changing a little bit, um, especially as you mentioned, the prime minister, the former prime minister Abe, uh, he really promoted uh, the, the concept of womanomics 
And I think it really has helped in terms of how women have been able to find um, more opportunities in the economy, more opportunities in society. Uh, but again, going back to my earlier point, everything is relative compared to you know many countries in in um, in Europe, um, even compared to the US, uh, other countries in Asia, Japan is still very much behind in terms of how women are you know, participating or not participating um, in the economy or in the society. So that really is something that I feel very passionate about because I see how things can be different in other parts of the world. And Japanese women are actually, according to OECD study um, survey, we are, Japanese women are uh, very well educated. If you look at the adult survey, you know, we do adult mm -hmm. survey, right, for, you know, um, you know, adult population, Japanese women come at the top, you know, of all the countries we cover in that survey in terms of literacy skills, in terms of numeric skills. So we are at the top in terms of skill levels. Yet, if you look at the gender gap, um, Japan is one Big. of the worst countries. Mm -hmm. It's it, Korea and Japan. We always come at the bottom. You know, if you look at you know the uh, income um, income gap, it's it's about twenty six percent between men and women. So there's a lot to be done on on that front. Yeah, it's interesting. Before I will continue with this, but I, I think I didn't do enough in terms of uh, welcoming uh, the people who joined us today. Um, actually, the setup is a bit different from what I used to, so I can't we can't see you. That's one thing. I have been told. I think you can use the chat function and the Q and A. So if you and my, you Mikos and my conversation something seems interesting, don't hesitate to. <clears throat> to ask a question and uh, I will pick it up, do my best to pick it up. Apparently you can also raise your hand, but I'm not sure whether I'm going to see it. But if I do see it, uh, I'll do my best uh, and you can ask questions later. But coming back to what you sa just said, Yumiko, very interesting. Also because Germany actually is also, it's a bit better, the wage gap, but it's really bad uh, uh, also, than in, uh, better than in Japan. And, um, and I looked a little bit at the numbers. <clears throat> Um, uh, employment rates have gone up a lot in Germany, but also I saw, and I was surprised a lot since Womenomics started in Japan. And I think, well, one issue here we're debating a lot is uh, actually even by OECD standards, employment rates of women are high, but many of them, in particular mothers, work part-time and, and then very low hours. Uh, and there are various incentives. Yeah. Uh, well, tax incentives that promote that uh, kind of uh, behavior. But uh, what you can also see, so Germany has invested enormously into childcare and all day schools. And you do see an effect on employment and also hours work. And my understanding is that in Japan and also South Korea, there are also efforts to uh, invest uh, quite a bit in, in, in childcare. So, so it's interesting to compare the two. Um, uh, uh, I don't know, how is it? Uh, is more childcare now provided to make it easier yeah. for women to work? Yeah. There has been a, a very big push on that front in Japan. The, um, as I said earlier, Prime Minister Abe actually made a priority um, area in terms of how the government was spending um, a lot of budget to increase the number of uh, you know, childcare facilities, uh, really trying to help women um, to, to, to work. Um, the if you look at the female labor uh, market, uh, the female labor participation rate, it really has improved quite a bit uh, over the last uh, seven to eight years. Um, it has now exceeded the, that of the, the United States. So now more women in Japan are working than women in, in America, for example. So that is actually pretty amazing, you know, over the mm -hmm. last seven, eight years, you know, Japanese women are started to work um, more in the, um, in the labor market. So that's good. Having said that, if you look at the, uh, as I said earlier, the gender gap in terms of how women are paid compared to men, it is still one of the largest gaps, right? 26%. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Why is it that more, even if, you know, we have more women uh, in, in, in a labor market, they're not getting paid. Uh, one of the main reasons is, is the fact that women uh, in, in general, they tend to uh, engage in part-time jobs, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. or we call it 
irregular irregular workers versus mm -hmm. regular workers. Regular workers are the ones who typically join large companies at the at the at the time of graduation, you know, 22 years old, and they stay with the com same companies for 35 years, you know, under the lifetime mm -hmm. employment system. Irregular workers are more contract workers. Mm -hmm. uh, they tend to work shorter hours. They tend to have more, um, and sort of, you know, project to project, job to job type of situations. And a lot of women are actually in that segment of a labor market. And those people tend to get paid much less salaries uh, versus regular workers. So even though we are having more women in the labor market, they are not getting the same level of compensation, same level, you know, opportunities, promotions. And that is one big area for us to be really uh, looking at closely and we have to come up with solutions. Um, so yes, you were right. We are having more childcare facilities, um, but quite frankly, in terms of women taking up higher, you know, more senior level jobs and getting paid in the same way as men do, uh, we are still way behind. We got to do a lot better job in, in in that department. Yeah, I'm just thinking now that you're talking about these irregular workers because there's also it's a general uh, issue, no? More and more of them, even men, not only women, also men. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, isn't there there a term that that's used in Japan that uh, uh, that includes a German word like something Arbeiter or something. Does that ring a bell? No, I'll, I'll no, look it up. No. Is that is like a regular versus regular workers kind of? Terminology? Yeah, the a word for these irregular workers. Um, I've mm -hmm. seen it, but perhaps it's not that common. Otherwise, you would know. But well, I what mean, is I don't, you know, I don't think it's. I mean, it, it, it's a trend, right? So Germany, I'm sure you have the same situation as Japan do. Uh, we do in a sense that you guys are getting old we're getting old too so we have yeah. a lot of older workers and well quite frankly older workers they are not going to work in the same way as they used to when they were you know 20 years old when they're 30 years old right yeah. so they may have yeah. more flexible arrangements they may work less hours uh they probably work in a more you know it's like i said irregular workers type of environment and quite frankly that's actually going to be the case for many countries not only japan for europe as well so i think I don't think it's such a bad situation where people are having more flexibilities in terms of the way they work. But I do think at the same time, um, the irregular workers in Japan, they need to be assessed in a very fair way in terms of what mm -hmm. they produce. Even if they are working as irregular workers, they produce X. They should be getting paid for the work they do for X. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. just because the contract is different, the output has to be fairly assessed and yeah. the, the compensation should be based on the output not the nature of contract and i think that's that's really going to be very important especially when you are trying to embrace a very diverse labor market whether they are you know 25 years old or 65 years old or even 85 years old going forward right so it's really important that we have flexibility in the labor market and really we have, have we need to find ways to assess the output in a very mm -hmm. fair way so that there is an incentive and there's oh, and ultimately that's going to lead to um, very um, efficient allocation of resources, which is us people, right? Mm -hmm. Depending on the outputs, depending on the skill levels. Yeah, well, well the, those are very good point points. So people here are trying to help me. There's Kerstin Kuhls who said, you mean Arubaito for part-time workers. But I didn't. I looked up the term, and there's a term, perhaps it's not that common, which is called Frieter. Frieter? Are oh, you familiar Frieder, with yes, that? Yes. Uh -huh. And it comes from free and Arbeiter. So it's partly a German oh, term. Okay. So anyway, yeah, but uh, so that's very interesting. And also, so uh, I, I can add that here in Germany as well, you know, climbing up the uh, career ladder is very difficult for, Germ uh, for women still. And, and we attribute it a lot to the fact that many reduce hours a lot when they have children and then you don't really get back into the uh, career track. Uh, there's an interesting, so perhaps one last thing about women, but then we had other issues too, but it would be interesting, just that I would be curious about it because now there's a, um, the coalition has decided that there should be a quota for boardrooms. It's not a law yet, but then, and then there's a women's movement behind it and they just had a very, fancy campaign in a magazine where they basically said 
I am a quota woman because it is a lot of sometimes, you know, people say, oh, this woman is just there because there's a quota. It's a quota woman. They want to uh, get away with the stigma. Are there strong women's move, movements in Japan who are trying to fight for more rights or is that not? Yeah, I, I, the, the, in terms of you mentioned quota, that's actually going to be a case in many countries. I mean, Europe yeah. as well as, for example, um, a legally binding requirement in terms of diversity uh, requirements on, on the level of uh, corporate boards uh, in the U.S. as well. California, California state of California has introduced, um, you know, a, a law that requires all California companies, you know, companies with headquarters in California, they have to have minority women or uh, the, it's, a, it's a gender balance. Um, and that's legally binding in California now. And similar um, situations in many other European countries, you know, they're are a lot of countries that are requiring by law a certain percentage of uh, you know uh, gender uh, mm -hmm. balance on the uh, at the board level. Do we have that in Japan? No, we don't have legally binding quota in terms of how what you know percentage of board members should be men versus women. Uh, we don't have that. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, there is a, a, a lot of mom, uh, sort of shift the momentum, or I should say, focus on that particular issue um, but there is at this point there is no legally binding quota mm -hmm. the Keda Ren, which is a very powerful business federation in Japan they just announced that they are going to target um, 30 percent uh, women ratio women percentage on all member companies by 2030. Wow. That's good. So that's that's pretty, better than we do. Again, I, I'm, glad, <laughs> I'm glad that Ken and Ren is now saying, hey, this is going to be our target 2030. Mm -hmm. We want to have 30% women. That's great. But at the same time, it's not legally binding requirement. So if member state, member com companies, mm -hmm. for whatever reasons, cannot reach that 30% uh, target, what's going to happen to them? Are they going to be paying fines or a penalty? No. Mm -hmm. um so you know again these things are you know there are there are a lot of people saying we're going to do this we're going to do that but at the end of the day we don't have legally binding quota and quite frankly um i come from a private you know banking background i come from goldman sachs and if somebody asked me you know so what do you think of quarter i would just say no i don't want a quarter you know i want to be mm -hmm. i want to be promoted to whatever because of my own merits. I don't wanna mm. be seeing as somebody who would say, oh, you're a quarter woman, you know what I mean? Mm. So I would want to say that, hey, quarter, that's, you know, I, I'd rather you be don't want that. as, as okay. me, as a person, as a professional mm. uh, person. Uh, but, so that's been my sort of basic sort of stance, but having seen the situation in Japan and how slowly things have been mm. progressing or not progressing, I almost feel like Japan has come to the point where they might actually have to go that route just because they don't have Change. any more time to waste. And they have been talking about it for the longest time. I think, however, mm. they should start on the political front because mm. Private companies are private companies. At the end of the day, there's capital market, right? There is a lot of pressure from capital markets. They got to do what they need to do in terms of investors, you know, telling, you know, companies what they want them to do. On the political front, um, that's where we need to see a change in terms of what leaders can do to show, you know, the world, the, the you know, Japanese population, what should be done on, you know, mm -hmm. at the political leader level. Mm -hmm. um, so I think when we talk about quarter, I think we got to look at the, the, the you know, policymakers um, situation and then say, maybe on a temporary basis, you don't have to actually put in a place legally binding uh, quarter system forever, but just put in a place something, you know, for the next five years and see what mm -hmm. happens. And you can always remove it once you okay. reach a certain point. Um, so that's what I think Japan should do. Okay, well, that's a good perspective. We spend a lot of time on uh, on women in quotas now, but it's super interesting, also your insights. But I did want to ask another thing, uh, or one thing that Germany looks to Japan now, or there are two things, actually. One is COVID, because, uh, you know, we here in, uh, in Europe, we have the impression that uh, somehow Asian countries, including uh, Japan, they do control it much better than we do over here. You didn't really have a national lockdown. I understand the numbers are going up now, but 
uh, Japan seems to have managed this really well. And we're wondering why and what uh, what are you doing and uh, can we copy it? And do you have some perspectives on this? Of course, it's also an island and it's um, different climate, perhaps, whatever. There are many theories, but uh, well, I don't know. Do you ever look at Europe at all? Well, I guess you do, because of course, uh, the world economy is also influenced a lot by what's happening in Europe and, yeah, and, I mean, honestly, and the US. We, yeah. we, we Okay, so no one knows exactly why. I mean, not only Japan, but in general, I think some other Asian countries have been doing relatively well, right? I mean, yeah. If you look at mm -hmm. even China, is doing really well. South mm -hmm. Korea. I mean, these are the early, you know, early on, those are countries where things started to happen. But mm -hmm. look at those countries now, including Japan, we are actually in a pretty good shape. Um, I just came back from Kyoto. I, I, mm -hmm. I took a family trip there. Things are just totally Great. normal. I mean, you guys yeah. are just totally locked. I mean, things have gotten a little worse in Europe yeah. over the last month yeah. or so. And, and a lot of countries are now, you know, basically going back to the springtime in terms of how restrictive um, economic movements yeah. and you know, social movements are being controlled. But it, it, we have, as you said, have not, um, we have not had um, draconian um, restrictions, you know, restrictive measures that have been you know, uh, placed on, on, on the economy and society by the government. So, th for example, as you said, number, uh, the number of new cases has been increasing. And what the government has actually done in the last, over the last two days is that, okay, Tokyo, for example, the governor said, we're going to shorten business hours for bars and restaurants, mm -hmm. you know. So those are the things that they've been doing, but compared to what, European governments have been doing, it's nothing. nothing. I mean, you yeah. still walk around the streets of Tokyo, you see people walking around like a, as if this is a, you know, nothing really, you know, different is happening. Uh, so draconian actions have not been, um, have not been, um, you know, implemented in Japan. However, what I can see in terms of, you know, my husband is American, so I talk to my, you know, my relatives there and a lot of friends there. I talk to my colleagues in, in France. What I see, uh, you know, difference between Japan and other countries is the fact in Japan, there is this very strong sense of collective goodness. Mm -hmm. So for example, um, you know, wearing mask, for whatever reason, it is a political statement. I don't understand this in the United States, right? Yeah. So wearing a mask alone is a political statement. For whatever reason, that's not a political statement in Japan. It's a collective mm -hmm. goodness. It's mm -hmm. a, you know, when you are part of a community, when you're part of a, you know, society, mm -hmm. that's the duty, that's a responsibility you carry out as a member of the local community or local, you know, whatever, you know, community you belong to. And that's the strong sense of, being part of the community, um, that I think is a very differentiating, um, mm -hmm. I think, elements that I see in this country, especially like I said, I, I you know, I spent almost all my, you know, uh, adult life in the US. Mm -hmm. And when I came back here, I sensed that. Um, I sensed that there was a very strong sense of being part of the community. So you got to do the right thing for the community, for the society mm -hmm. first, before you think about what you want to do as an individual, you know, person. And that mm -hmm. whole mentality actually has played out really well in this crisis, just because when health, you look at yeah. the crisis, mm -hmm. It is a public health issue. Of course, if a young person, you might get, you know, if you get ex infected, you, maybe you're okay because you're 25 years old, right? Mm. But that's not the point. If you are going to be a good citizen, good member of the community, it doesn't matter, you know, what may happen to yourself. You have to mm. think about what that means to the community you belong to. So mm -hmm. when this whole crisis started to happen, there was absolutely no issue whatsoever in terms of how people try to, you know, they would never go out without wearing a mask. Um, there was a lot of sort of, you know, washing hands or this general hygiene um, practices people would just do. But all of that um, is done in a sense, you know, in, in a sort of a sense for community um, responsibility so much more than just individual, you know, being mm -hmm. healthy. Of course, you have to, you want to be healthy. You want to be, you know, whatever, you know, whatever, but that is sec almost secondary. So I think that's a 
very big difference in terms of how yeah. people have been behaving. Even though we don't have, we have not had draconian um, restrictions in terms of what people are allowed to do or not allowed to do. Um, so I think that actually has played a big role in terms of how Japan has been able to cope uh, with this uh, crisis. What I also read is, uh, I don't know, so what in articles over here, right, that uh, Japan has kind of focused on the main things. So, um, so identified very early on what contributes to a big Spread, uh, and has focused on the three C's. So clo avoid closed places with poor ventilation, avoid crowded places and close contact mm -hmm. settings. Three so C's, that also yeah. seems like a good public health message because it's easy to remember. Here we debate a lot about uh, details sometimes of where do you wear, wear the mask. And I mean, this what you told me about the community being part of a community that sounds very convincing also. But perhaps also this, the, uh, the the clear message about what to avoid, uh, do, do you think that also played a role? Yeah, I think so too. I think there was a, you know, I mean, maybe it's a, it's a good thing and bad thing, but there was no questioning on the part of general public um, yeah. in terms of what should be done. So there wasn't much discussion or debate whether, you know, these uh, guidelines are good or bad and people just said, okay, we're going to do what we need to do, which is to basically follow these guidelines. Uh, again, these are not draconian, you know, oh. they're, they're very loose, right? They said, please avoid, uh, you know, gatherings, please avoid being in a closed space. You know, these are just guidelines and there's absolutely mm. no, you know, no decrees, like no laws. Just guidelines, no, no, no laws, no, no decrees. Absolutely no, no laws. Mm. But people still follow these guidelines. Again, mm. being part of the, the community that they belong to. Um, it's a sense of duty that people carry the, with themselves. And I think that is, pandemic is, is not one person. It's not individuals, right? It's about the community. Mm -hmm. It's about the society. And I do think that sense of being part of that big you know, community, I think it's very important when you try to, you know, address such a such a serious pandemic. I mean, again, yeah, but, there are a lot of theories, yeah. right? I mean, there's yeah, theory, yeah, there's theory about this BCG, this you know, this you know shot that we all you know we all got as a child, you know, one of the ah. you know uh, required um, you know shots. Whether that has been one of the reasons why you know Japan has survived, well, you know, there are a bunch of different theories. Who knows? Yes, who knows? But, but that was from your perspective. Yeah, no, it's very interesting and very insightful. I have to do, I, I don't uh, do full justice to the questions that are coming in. And I'm sorry about it, but we're having this uh, lively discussion. And at this one point, we don't have three minutes left. You can, we want to be sort of remain in the time because that's the idea of the, um, I could uh, talk uh, for hours with you, but knowing that it's 10 o'clock on a Friday evening, I'm, no, I'm not going to go on for hours. We'll do it another time. One thing that's also, of course, uh, raises a lot of questions here and people are wondering about, is this new big Asia Pacific trade agreement that you just entered with China and um, and many other nations, I think 28% of global trade, right? And of course, these have been difficult. We know at the OECD, these have been difficult times for multilateralism in general, for trade also, trade um, agreements, a lot of frictions, etc. So I think and people here are unsure. They wonder, well, maybe it's good, you know, because it could be good for multilateralism, having, you know, bringing countries around the table, but it could also lead to block building and what if we are left out, etc. So how is that viewed in Japan, this new... Um, this and new I trade agreement. Very I, I think it's been viewed very positively, but to mention that this is not a, you know, it's not a new phenomenon. We've been working on it for, I believe, seven or eight years. So it's been a long, 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 they're having a lot of, you know, disagreements and there have been a lot of issues, um, but they managed to get here. And I think what's interesting about this agreement is the fact that there are different levels of economies that are part of that you know, treaty, right? There are 15 countries, India dropped out at the end, but 16 countries started and then 15 countries remain. If you look at the developmental levels, stages, they're very different. So there had to be a lot of compromising situations in order for them to come to the table and say, okay, let's sign this treaty. And the fact that they have been able to do it 
is is a big deal. And I do think, okay, I, I know there are people in your in your and wondering, scratching their head, wait, what does this mean? You know, are we just kind of losing out, right? It's totally understandable that some people might feel that way, but I think this can actually send a very positive message to many other countries outside the region because basically, like I said, you know, it's not, if you compare to other uh, free trade agreements, you know, whether it's uh, with the Japan and uh, EU or Japan and the UK, they had a EPA or, you know, DPP, it's not in the same level of, you know, um, uh, uh, agreement. But as I said, this one has a lot of different levels of economies, mm -hmm. right? So that is not easy to achieve, even, you know, um, 15 out of 16. And I do think, I hope that people are going to look at this and say, the world has been shifting away from multinational trade frameworks over the last four years, over the last three, four years, right? And okay, there was election in the United States and who knows, maybe the new administration might change their policy a little bit, but I, I doubt that they're going to change the you know, policy overnight. You know, that mm. might take some time. So the fact that the, the world and not, not every country, but many countries have been shifting away from multinational trade frameworks. And the fact that this RCEP was, it was able to reach to this point is a very strong message that perhaps the rest of the world, whether it's the United States or British, um, the, the UK, perhaps they would take a look at this situation and say, wait a minute, maybe this is a time for us to revisit the whole multinational trade framework because these are the countries which are not in the same level of, of the US or Europe in terms of economic levels. If they have been able to achieve this level of treatment um, treaty, you know, what does it mean to these economies? You know, there are a lot of compromising situations, but at the same time, there's huge upside. If those countries can do this, what does this mean to Germany? What does this mean to the US? What does this mean to UK? And I do think this is going to trigger that discussion. And the timing is interesting because there was an interest, uh, there was a um, election in the United States, which will probably mean a lot of change on that front. Uh, the UK is now in the process of leaving completely um, the EU. So the timing is interesting. All these things are happening at the same time. This is a really interesting trigger for large countries in particular, developed economies, to revisit the value of multinational um, trade frameworks. So I wouldn't be, I, you know, I, I think it's an opportunity for Germany, mm -hmm. for EU, um, to, to rethink about the upside of the multinational trade framework. So if, you know, 15 countries, look at these countries. There are, a lot of them are developing yeah. economies. If they can yeah. do this, what does that mean to your country, right? Yeah, yeah, so, we should get together, yeah. That's, uh, that's, a, that's a very appealing plea, I find, uh, Yumiko, coming from perhaps so we were past our time, but I'll, I'll, do, I'll ask you one last question and then I'll let you uh, have your Friday evening. Um, so we are approaching the, I think, 14th of December, this, the signing of the OECD convention and Japan joined a little bit later, right? I think yep. in 1964. What I'm wondering is, uh, what is, so you represent the OECD uh, in Tokyo, what is the role of, the, what, what does the OECD mean for Japan? So is it, well, what, one level is the government, right? What, uh, is it important to them? What, to, uh, how do they see it in the future? Perhaps also the contribution to the multilateral COVID-19 response. That's one uh, level of question. But the second is, uh, so let's say citizens, um, do they know about the OECD even in Japan? So here, when I tell people I work for the OECD, they often say, uh, oh, oh, OSCE, which is another organization which looks at the elections. So they don't, well, one thing is very well known here in Germany, which is the PISA study. Everybody knows that. So if I tell them it's PISA and say, ah, okay, okay. And then sometimes it rings a bell, but it's not so well known in the general public. So these two things, what's the role of the OECD in Japan for government and then 
for citizens. That would be interesting for us to I know think here. There is a, I think there's a sense uh, among policymakers that they're also very high level of policymakers as well as, you know, um, maybe some business leaders as, as well. The sense that Japan should play a bigger role uh, in the international scene, and especially in terms of, um, uh, you know, bridging between you know, developed economies, whether they are US or European countries in the rest of Asia. Japan has a place in there in terms of how they can be, you know, go between. And I think that uh, OECD is a good platform for Japan to play that role. If you think about membership countries, Japan and Korea are the only countries uh, from Asia that are part of OECD. Right, and like I said, you know, um, this uh, RCEP agreement that, that that you know, which just um, um, uh, was Concluded. announced, mm -hmm. Japan played a very important role in terms of mm -hmm. putting all these 16 countries in the same bucket and say, hey guys, we're gonna do it, we're gonna make it, you know, work. Um, so they were very instrumental to bring this uh, agreement together. If you look at the TPP negotiation, Japan was again extremely instrumental, and mm -hmm. I think that um, uh, Japan. Um, was one of the first countries to conclude the EPA agreement with the UK when the UK decided to to leave um, EU. EU and Japan had an EPA last two years ago. Um, so if you look at some of these things that Japan has been doing, I think there is a strong sense that Japan has the responsibility to play a go-between um, between Japan, I'm sorry, between developed economies and, and Asian countries, and perhaps even Asia and US and Asia and uh, other European countries. So in that context, I think um, OECD is seeing a very good platform for us mm -hmm. to say, hey, you know, we are part of OECD, almost, you know, representing Asia, but there are a bunch of other countries in Asia that are going to, you know, potentially become, want to become members of OECD in the future. But even though they're not members, there are a number of interesting programs and activities that are being carried out in Asia by OECD. Japan can be a, a very good promoter of OECD within the region. So that's one thing I would say in terms of what Japan sees OECD as, as, a, as a sort of almost platform for, for, for them to play a big role uh, in terms of bringing Asia into the international society uh, uh, scenes, um, in particular with OECD. In terms of how the general public is, is seeing OECD, um, OECD is quoted by media very often. Uh, pizza, yeah. you know, you mentioned Japan loves pizza. So every oh, you're time good. Pizza comes yeah. out, <laughs> you know, everyone's like, oh my God, Japan goes up, that goes down, and there, there's a lot of excitement about the ranking. Um, so I think there's something similar between Germ Germany and Japan. You know, we love these rankings, especially when it comes to education. Mm -hmm. We're kind of obsessed. Yeah. Um, so very similar. So I think there is a very good recognition and, and sense of like uh, OECD being a very useful um, uh, mm -hmm. sort of entity for, for Japan. Um, but at the same time, I do think that the, even among the general public, I think there are probably a lot of people feeling as if, you know, OECD was started as a European, you know, more Euro-centric Euro organization. And now, 60 years later, it really has become global. But if you look at the member countries, Asia is not very big, right? Yeah. So I think that, that there is a sense, again, that was a sense that I described among leaders, among political leaders and business leaders, but even in general, uh, I think people are starting to feel as, okay, look at the COVID situation. A lot of Asian countries have done really, really well, much better than European countries mm -hmm. and, and, and the United States. What that means potentially is the fact that the recovery process is going to be much easier or much faster, much shorter for Asia. So that might actually give Asia a very strong sort of momentum in terms of how economies can really grow back. And in that context, maybe there is a strong sense for Japan and Asia to be able to contribute in a much more meaningful way to the international collaboration, whether it's about trade, um, you know, agreements or it's, it's it's maybe public health promotion, and I yeah. think OECD can be facilitating uh, yeah. those initiatives coming out of Asia. Maybe we should be, you know, really sharing best practice, um, you know, examples. Hey, washing hands, wearing mask, you know, you know, whatever. <laughs> but I do think these are things that Asia, including Japan, should be really 
telling the world in terms of what we have experienced, some failures, some success stories. Um, and I think OECD can be very good platform for us to do it. Exchange. So I think there is mm -hmm. sense, yeah, I think the sense of, of that sort of need and desire, um, even among the public, you know, uh, the general population. Well, yeah, that's uh, an inspiring proposal to end our, so we're a little bit past our half an hour, but I've really enjoyed it talking to you and thank you, Yumiko, uh, for dedicating your uh, evening or office hour, as I'm not sure what it is, uh, to, uh, to me, to us. And uh, I hope we'll do perhaps something with our other centers in Mexico, Washington again. Anyway, so this is a new format. Thank you also the audience for listening and sorry I haven't been able in this very lively discussion to throw into too many questions. We'll have another one like this on the, um, I think it's the 11th of December with uh, Stephanie Stancheva, who is a Harvard professor and has very interesting work about people's um, uh, knowledge about economics and their beliefs and how that influences, um, uh, how, how, that, how their knowledge influences their political Uh, beliefs and she also has work about uh, how if and how people are uh, willing to abandon civil li liberties and crises like the one we're facing today so we're going to discuss that in a similar format i hope you enjoyed it as much as i did thank you very much yumiko and uh, have a good evening and a good weekend thank in, in tokyo thank so thanks much. for joining us thank you bye bye, bye, -bye. <laughs>